think of it as a fire. If you stop thinking the pain is bad and the absolute like loneliness and devastation, if you can think of it as a fire that has to burn you up so that you can be reborn into the version that you will be when this person or this event or this thing is no longer with you. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Mark Rose Podcast. Today I have Kelsey Chittick. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Mark. It's good to see you again. You know, the last time I saw you, we were on a dance floor. Yep. Lock souls. We yep. got to jam. I got to hear a little, we were at a 40th birthday, which, um, you know, for my 40th, I bought a red convertible, which I think <laughs> is about as uh, cliche. Yeah. As, it's horrible. Is it? It's horrible. It was. My friend said, uh, you're going through a midlife crisis. And I said, why do you say that? And they said, you bought a red convertible, which is right. the ultimate. So we were at a 40th birthday celebrating halfway through someone else's life. And, you know, I was just really struck by your story and Thanks. just how much like life hands us stuff that we just don't know. We can't expect, we can't prepare for. And you know, it asks us to be someone and those things ask us to be someone we've never been. And I, I think that's one of the most, oh man, like profound things about grief, but also, uh, yeah, like I just think about what life sometimes demands in order to keep going. And it's, it's parts of you don't even know exist. So maybe we could start with, with that story. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I had a very typical life. I grew up in Florida, I had one brother. We had resources. My dad was a lawyer with a slight alcohol problem, nothing to get your panties in a bunch about, but just enough that, <laughs> you know, he was, he couldn't drive us home very often. Um, my family was, I had grandparents, aunts, uncles. I had, I remember thinking like, boy, I lucked out. Yeah. I, re I remember actually feeling growing up, like I'm, I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones. Like things just went my way. Um, I swam in college. I went to university of North Carolina um, when I was 19, I met this big football player who was um, just different than any man I'd ever met, just the kindest, most connected, loving human. He just loved life in a way I had never seen. I mean, he went for it. Every party, every night, every hug, every time he had sex, every time. I and mean, he loved women. He <laughs> loved life. He loved, he just loved being alive. And um, we met and we both were on, it was odd because I was 19, he was 21, but we were both on this spiritual journey. Somehow, um, both of our parents had gotten divorced. My parents got divorced when I was 15 or separated and his parents had just gotten separated. And we kind of were in this weird spot. And when we met each other, it just felt like home. And we both were like, what do we want to do with our life? We want to serve. We want to live the best life ever. And um, we ended up dating and then he went into the NFL. He played football for seven years. He won a Super Bowl with the Rams in 1999. Yeah. And I wasn't the typical like hot NFL wife. I had like a nerdy outfit on and I wore a backpack and um, we were just regular people. And we we knew, I remember asking Nate, like, when are we going to have kids? And he was like, you know, there's no rush. We just got married. But something in me was really like, we got to have these kids soon. Um, so we had babies pretty young. Um, my kids are now, I'm 45. My kids are 15 and uh, almost 18. Um, but we built this great life. We came out to California to visit a friend in Manhattan Beach, and we were going to stay about two weeks, and we ended up staying 18 years. But then around the age of, I want to say, 35, I would say, I we had a, maybe a seven and a nine-year-old, and life was good. We live in a great town. Um, we both had kind of corporate jobs that we liked, but not not our dream job, but I was happy. I did stand-up comedy. He was working on a nonprofit, and we made it. We have, we have a white picket fence. The gate has always been broken, which should have been the sign for me um, <laughs> that some shit was coming. But around 36, I started to have panic attacks just in a weird way. I just couldn't, I couldn't settle. I couldn't figure out there was this like foreboding feeling. And I was anxious all the time. I was um, worried about the kids. I was worried about money. I was worried about social things. I, I didn't want to travel at all. And my job had me going back and forth to the East Coast. And I just started to panic. And I was like, what is wrong with me? So about at 38, I think I started on a pretty deep dive into books, Radical Acceptance by Jar Bridge, Untethered Soul, like just books that I, and I grew up in a pretty Buddhist, open-minded, spiritual family. Nate and I went to Agape in LA wow. with Dr. Beckwith. And um, his parents were actually, his father was a minister at Harvard and his mom was a nun at Holy Cross, but they were all about service. Um, so everybody wow. was, yeah, they were, it was different. We grew up with, I mean, 
my mom talked about dispensa way before anybody else did. We had Esther Perel. We were meditating as kids. So I had this big toolkit and I had never had to use it because life was pretty good. But around 38, I just, I, I was losing it. And so I dug in and I ended up reading a book um, by Vishen called um, Vision Lakiani. Lakiani, yeah. Okay. Code of the Extraordinary Mind. And it was just kind of a, a book, you know, a lot of books just kind of touch you and it, it kind of changed my mind about some things. Nate read it and we ended up giving it to some friends. And through all that, I they had said, hey, why don't you come to this event in Jamaica? And I remember um, Nate and I were in New York and I was like, I think, I, I, don't, I don't think I can go to Jamaica. I can't go away. I'm too nervous. And he was like, listen, we, we need to live our lives. Like you need to like stop being afraid. It's time for you to go. Like we've got to stop living this tiny life in this tiny circle, raising kids and just being stressed about the day-to-day -day things. Like we were called for bigger than this. So please go to Jamaica. Everything's going to be okay. And um, that was on November 8th. I left. Nate took me to the airport and he just was like, go have the time of your life. I hope you learned so much. I hope you have friends. I hope you smoke weed. I hope you dry hump a stranger on the dance floor, like let it rip sister. You know, we'd been married 16 years by then. Um, and he's like, come back changed, come back a different person. I, I want you to live the life you were meant to live. And so I went and I made, met these friends and I, I, I landed, I wasn't anxious at all. I, I don't know what happened when I stepped foot in that country, but everything changed. And then on the last day of the event, so it was Saturday, um, I got a phone call and I didn't know what the number was. And then I got a phone call again from my best friend and it was just a text. And she said, hey, don't do the Kelsey and freak out. But um, Nate has fallen at, the, at a birthday party at a trampoline park in Los Angeles. And they're taking him to UCLA and we're going to go get the kids. And Mark, in that moment, I knew he was gone. I knew he was dead. I just, I could feel it. I had been waiting for it. It had felt, it felt like when they when she said that, like whatever the last five years I had been picking up mm -hmm. just landed and I, I got real quiet oh, wow. and I didn't know anything yet, but then we got in the car. I was like, I've got to get back to LA. And on the ride back, um, a doctor from UCLA called and he said, Mrs. Chittick, I'm so sorry, but your husband didn't make it. And I was like, is he dead? And he's like, your husband had a massive heart attack and he didn't survive. And I was like, is my husband dead? And he's like, yes, your husband's dead. And so he had died in front of my nine and 12 year old at 42. That's how we got to this place. That's how we got here. That's, that's how we got here. So that day began what I would call probably the most exceptional, painful, horrible, amazing five years of my life. Um, I had, it was my worst nightmare. I mean, I didn't know a life without that man. And he was so good. Yeah. And he was, he was our person. He, I mean, it still gets me. Um, but at some point uh, on that plane ride home, I was on the plane and I was hyperventilating and I knew I had to go home. My kids didn't know yet. And when the seatbelt sign went off, I'm, I was throwing up in the bag, this uh, beautiful Jamaican woman in this like gorgeous red, red and orange and purple dress, walked up and she put her hand on my forehead and her hand on my heart. And she said, baby girl, I don't know what you're going through, what awaits you on the other side of this plane, but I want you to know that I'm praying for you. So many people are praying for you and God is with you. So I want you to decide wow. who you want to be when you land in Los Angeles. You need to decide who you want to be a week, a year, and a month from now or whatever, um, because that's the only decision you have right now, baby girl. So take a deep breath slow your breathing down and just know you're strong enough to make it. And it changed my life. So I spent the next six hours on that plane just deciding that my kids had already lost their dad, so they weren't going to lose me. And five years later, um, my kids are thriving. Um, we have walked through some dark years and I've had some medical stuff, I think from stress. Um, but we are, we are back up and we have made it through what feels like just the greatest transformation of a life. God, I got shivers just hearing the story of that woman speaking to you. Yeah. It's like you never know how an angel's going to show up in the journey, you know? Yeah. She changed my life. And, um, you know, I tell people this all the time, but when you're in great pain and great transformation, there are angels everywhere. I mean, that's just how it works. It just works that we are not alone, especially in our in our darkest moments. And if you can pay attention and slow down enough because you already feel like you're in an altered world. 
So start looking for things that don't make sense. And it's so beautiful because you see just the universe or God or whatever your belief is, they send, they send the people, they send the synchronicities. They, you don't have to do it alone. You just have to believe that there's something bigger going on. Um, and that's kind of what I've clung to the whole time that early on when I told the kids that he had died, you know, I, I couldn't figure out how I was going to tell them because they were old enough to, you know, they were nine and 12. They loved him. Like they weren't babies. They weren't, and they weren't on their way to their own life. We were smack in the middle of like the best part of being a parent. Your kids mm-hmm. aren't into sex and drugs, but <laughs> they can like make their own cereal and, you know, put themselves to bed. It, it was like, it's like the honeymoon phase. But I just told them like, listen, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I've got you and you don't need to worry about a thing. And I said, your father would have never left us if he um, didn't think we'd be okay. Cause it's not, it's not his style. And, um, I said, I'm enough and we're going to have a great life. So just keep your eye on that prize. And it's going to be, it's going to be rough for a long time, but I promise you, we're going to make it out of this. And we all committed to that. And we committed to every single emotion. And still to this day, um, now I kind of ride the waves with a smile because I know the ocean now, like I'm not grief is, I mean, it is a big ocean. And in the beginning you are so close to drowning. And I think a lot of people do. And you never get back up. But if you can become a surfer and you start to go, oh, I've seen this before. I can do this. Now I, I welcome the times of big grief because I, um, I know how to navigate them. And I also know they push me forward. That's how I got here. And then I, I wrote a book about it, just mostly so my kids would remember my husband and that I would remember because you start to forget. Um, and that's kind of changed my life. And now the work I do is act as a guide to people that are, you know, three weeks to three years out of great trauma, because that's a really special spot where the pain is unbearable, but so is the um, ability to transform into something exceptional. For the people listening who might be just navigating, maybe, as you said, this sort of uh, acute phase of grief, I know you had this woman tell you, you know, while you're on the plane, but what is it that you wish they would know? Because there could be an acute phase of even going through a breakup. Yeah. And actually breakup is a lot like death. It's a, it's a, it's a letting go. You know, the, it all goes back to letting go. I think basically as I, as I look at what gives us pain, it's, it's losing something that we cared about, a person, a job, a house. It's just, it's, it's always about health, whatever it is. It's about letting go of what you thought you really wanted and needed to be happy. So the, the concept of starting to practice what it feels like to just feel what, when you lose something, when you lose your keys, when you lose your phone, but if you're in early grief, I mean, I, or early breakup, um, just be with it. It's like, think of it as a fire. It's just burning. It feel you feel like you're dying because you are. So if you stop thinking that's bad, and that's the biggest thing, if you stop thinking the pain is bad and the the absolute like loneliness and devastation, if you can think of it as a fire that has to burn you up so that you can be reborn into the version that you will be when this thing is no longer with you. So when Nate died, I died too. There's no possible way because my life was in juxtaposition to his. So when he died, the version of Kelsey that had a husband and a father and wasn't a single mom and you know, she died. She died the same moment he died. So if you can think of it as a death, but in a beautiful way of transformation and go, well, I'm still here. I'm still alive. So you've got something left in you and you're supposed to be here. So when you get broken up with, take to your bed and just sulk and feel it and just write about it. And I mean, I listen to so many sad Chicago songs and music. I mean, I, <laughs> there is nobody who can have a scotch and turn on music like Adele. And I just let it oh, rip. And Lord. I I set a timer sometimes. So I say, just like, go with it. It will. It's just impossible that it will always be this way. All of a sudden, God or somebody will send you a miracle or a, a person will show up that just, you can't believe that it, the synchronicities. My husband died on 11, 11 at 11, which I felt like was just such a nod from him. Like, don't get, don't get it twisted, lady. You're, there's divine intervention here, even though it looks catastrophic. How long did it take you to see that? Like Nate lived such a good life and it was such an honor to be his wife. I was so proud to do life with him and I had 21 years with him. So if you knew my husband, you knew that if he, he gave us, I mean, I'll cry talking about it. He gave us so much. He taught us so much about life that I knew the only way to honor him was just to fucking crush it. And I knew that 
he would want my kids to be happy. And he would be like, don't you, you, you bossed me around for 21 years, lady. You said you had it all figured <laughs> out. You thought you had all the answers. Now it's go time, lady. Like now it's time for you to put rubber to the road and do the work that you've been talking about your whole life, but never had to practice. So I would tell everybody what to do with their lives. I had all the answers. I just thought I knew everything. Um, so I just, I can hear him. I mean, I can close my ear and I can ask him a question. Um, and if he's not busy fighting the holy fires or doing whatever he does, wherever his soul is, I can hear him be like, and mostly he just says, stop talking. Stop talking. <laughs> okay, shit. You know, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, so I think honoring Nate was was an easy North Star for me. And his kids were awesome. And he raised those kids in nine and 12 years. They knew more than most men. If you if you listen to the speech my son gave in sixth grade at this memorial, it was just, I, it was a nod. It was like, we're okay. It's going to look different, but we're going to be okay. Wow. Just invited to that level of um, introspection and uh, yeah. dare I say maturity that yeah. some of us never touch. Today's episode is brought to you by Mana. Now look, we all know it's pretty much impossible to get everything we need nutritionally from diet alone today. And that's due to a lot of the farming practices, fertilizers, all that stuff. And even though we might have a healthy and varied diet, we still may not get all the minerals and nutrients that we need. This product, Mana, which I love, solves this problem through their all-in-one supplement that's made entirely from nature. It combines the wisdom and practice of ancient medicine with modern day science and innovation. It combines some of the highest quality minerals, amino, fulvic, and humic acids and nutrients gathered from some of the highest and lowest points on the planet, the mountains and the sea, all to provide a comprehensive and enhanced mineral matrix. Now the two main active ingredients in mana are shilajit and ocean plasma. One is black, one is white, one is plant-based, and one is ocean-based, yin and yang. Now, shilajit is a natural substance. It's found mainly in the Himalayas. It's been used in Ayurvedic medicine for 5,000 years to help maintain equilibrium in the body. Clinical studies have shown that shilajit has been proven to increase strength, endurance, and prevent illness. Now, ormus, or ocean plasma, has many regenerative and healing properties and has been used for thousands of years. The benefits of mana are insane. Shilajit and ormus, in addition to fulvic and humic acid, marine minerals, amino acids, protein, nootropics, triterpenes, magnesium, potassium, sulfur, calcium, sodium, and 88 trace minerals. They can help boost cognitive function, improve focus and memory, boost energy levels, provide fast recovery post-workout, enhance your libido and stamina, support testosterone production, and enhance immunity. The list obviously goes on and on. So I've been taking mana every day for the last three months now. I love it. I've been actually noticed an increase in not just my energy levels, but also I have an aura ring and I've been tracking my HRV and my HRV has gone up in the last three months significantly by an average of 20 points. And that's even though we've just had a kid, which is crazy. So if this all sounds like you wanna try it, which I'm guessing it does, and you're looking to supercharge your body, restore balance with this all-in-one solution, visit monavitality.com that's m-a-n-n-a-v-i-t-a-l-i-t-y.com use the code mark 20 for 20 percent off go get it now monavitality.com before he passed you were in a stand-up comedy yeah and i know just from the the brief interactions we've had i've found myself laughing through most of them and i'm curious at what point you were able to access levity or was it immediate I mean, I think laughter and pain are pretty much right on the edge of each other. Um, yeah, agreed. I, I don't think they're that far apart. Have you ever laughed till it hurt? You know, yeah. have you ever cried till you laughed? Or, you know, there's a ton of sayings that go with that. I think, you know, we label emotions that are comfortable one thing and that are uncomfortable another, but they're both both big swings. So great laughter is very similar to great grief, it takes you to a place you've never been and it makes you feel something really big. Uh, one of the feelings is much more enjoyable than the other. But I think his death was so shocking and so sudden and so surreal that we had to make fun of it because it, I was just like, only my only my husband, I mean, he's the first person to ever die at a trampoline park during toddler time. <laughs> I mean, it's just fucking ridiculous. You know, it's like, what, who does that? Who jump, jumps and dies? And it would be Nate because that's how special he was. And I can just see him being like, whoops. And, you know, and, and we would laugh about it right away. I'd be like, I could just imagine him like floating away from his body being like, oh goodness, they're the children. She's going to kill me. 
if she finds out, but then he would look up into where he always wanted to be, which was with God. I mean, this guy was so spiritually connected. Like he loved sunsets and he, every, every meal he ate was the best meal. It didn't matter if it was Taco Bell or someplace in Beverly Hills. He just was different. And I think he must've looked up and been like, I'm going home. I've done my work here. And in 42 years, he lived a very, very full life. If, if you read what he's done and what he accomplished, he crushed it. Um, and it, and this is kind of a side note, but it turned out after we got an autopsy that he did have CTE, which is the concussion, um, head oh, concussion football. disease that a lot of NFL players have. So in a lot of ways, I've been able, I've been lucky enough because of that to be able to couch this situation for me as a gift, because to take care of a man with CTE is really scary and um, dangerous and sad. And I have a ton of friends who have issues with it from playing football. So in some ways he gave us a, um, he gave us a gift because life wouldn't have been the way we think. And that's kind of another lesson. We, we have these plans. Like we think we know what it's going to look like five years. We, we don't, we just know right now. And for someone who never lived in the present moment, grief has been the best of focus of anybody. Cause you can only basically get through each moment the first three or four years. Yeah, I agree. Like grief has a way of you can't go to another moment. It's it's like, mm-hmm. sorry, I'm here. Sorry, I'm here. Sorry, I'm here. Like, yeah. and it's so that we will finally be, oh, I'm here too. I'm here too. I'm here too. Yeah. For me, I mean, I've never navigated what you're speaking of, your experience with Nate, uh, but in my experience with grief and loss, you know, there's that saying that time heals all. And I really don't agree with that. I, in that, I think, um, it really matters what we do with that time, you yeah. know, and if we don't turn towards or at least make the intention to begin to learn and heal from whatever is trying to move through us, uh, it will keep knocking at our door. You know, even if we try to smother it with drugs, alcohol, whatever, yeah. you know, TikTok, whatever is the thing that's trying to pull us outside of feeling, you know, you said that, which I really liked that, that we, we have feelings that are easy and feelings that are hard. And we tend to think feelings that are hard. Like I, my experience of seeing people navigate things like grief or anger, or emotions like that, is that there's something wrong with them that they have those feelings as opposed to, well, those are your feelings, you know? So yeah. you're having them for a reason and they're actually super important. I remember reading that the chemical construct of tears of sadness are different than tears of joy. Yes. So that tells you like there's something alchemical going on in your body that is trying to be moved through you. That's why I think crying feels so damn good, you know? Crying is the greatest thing. And we, you know, and I guess I don't, I didn't grow up in a culture. My husband cried every day. He watched like Mr. Holland's Opus and whatever. That man cried all that. He cried when he saw the kids in the morning. He cried when he said goodbye to them. So we were a crying family. So we, um, I continue to be a huge crier. Um, but now the nice thing about grief is it's it's a river that you get to learn over time if you so choose how to navigate it. So you get to decide as time goes on, when are you going to sit down and really focus on the pain? And sometimes there, sometimes it hits you on its own and you're like, well, I guess you're in charge right now. And as time goes by, as the years go by, you say like, I'm going to, I'm going to deal with you, but I'm not right now during the kid's school play. Like it's not a good idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But in the beginning, you're like, it's coming out during the school's play. Like that's <laughs> like, how we're going to roll coming. right now. It's coming. Get in. It's coming. Buckle up. Buckle up, buttercup, because you're about to be sobbing and snotty and you're going to be the center of attention. Your kids are going to kill you, but you can't stop it. Now I'm much better. I mean, I get wet eyes and that to me is just a reminder I loved him. I, I hope I never get to a point where I'm like, well, he's dead and you know, life is like that. Like I don't want to, I want to always be touched by it, but I don't want to ever not ever. I'm not afraid of hard things anymore because that was so brutal. And if you had asked me if I could have survived it before, I would have been like, there's no way. There's no possible way I can live without this man. And I used to say that to him, like, don't you die or I'll kill you. Like, (laughs) I will kill you if you die on me. I just didn't know an adult life without him. And um, my life now is exceptional and it's, it's, it's sad, it's lonely and it's exciting and it's fun. And I've met people and done things I would have never, ever had the opportunity to, to do. And um, I chose to marry early and fast. So I had 21 years of a great marriage. And now 
I don't see myself doing that again. I have this opportunity to kind of travel and do things like reverse that a lot of your group did. So a lot of people partied in their 20s and 30s. Well, I'm going to crush my 50s and 60s. So, <laughs> you know. I like um, it. Yeah. So I, the whole thing still, I will say, I don't feel like I'm on the same planet anymore. Like it, life is not what it was before. Not bad or good. It just, it's a completely different life. I feel completely different. I'm curious if the anxiety that you had prior to him passing, did that go? That went away initially, yes. And then as about when COVID hit, um, I panicked big time that I was going to die and I was alone with yeah, these two kids. And part of it was great because the whole world was kind of locked up where we already were. So I didn't have to pretend. Um, I ended up getting some some medical stuff that just came from that level of stress that diagnosis probably is what set me free finally. Cause I was like, well, shit, I can't, this train is these, these things are coming. I'm doing everything. I meditate. I do yoga. I eat well, Kelsey, you're here for the ride. So those two things, his death and that diagnosis, and I'm perfectly fine now, but, um, in that experience, those were the two great gifts of my life. I, I would rather not live through them again. Um, if I could, I, I'd like to take the next 40 years and just kind of sail. <laughs> just enjoy um, these ones. Yeah. If, if you're listening, God, and you want to throw me a bone, you know, like I'm good. I got uh, it. I'd like to but, have two of those. Could I get yeah. it? I'd like that order as well. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was fun. I hear you. Um, so that's when the anxiety stopped. When I really believe that if you die, I can't stop it. I couldn't stop my husband. I can't stop myself. I can't save my kids from pain. I will say from a parenting perspective, both of those things changed my life too, because I used to try to micromanage my kid's life. Now, because they've survived such hard things, I don't worry about the little things. So they forget their stuff. I don't care. They, you know, they, they, whatever I used to be so nervous about as a parent, I've let that go because I see their strength. They are on their own path. They're not my kids. They're not Nate's. They were born here to do their thing. And we, I mean, Nate always used to say, we chose each other, Kelsey. And I'd say, well, how did we all end up together? He's like, don't you remember we were up in heaven and we were like, put our hands in, we we're like, we're in. And, and I envisioned it now that, you know, Nate saying to all of us, it's going to get dicey around 2017. Are you guys in for it? And everybody was like, we're in dad. And I was like, all right. And he's like, you know, but it's going to be exceptional too. But are, do we all agree that we're going to ride this, this lifetime together? Um, and now we we're with him just in a different realm. I mean, I, I feel like He's alive and well in our home. He's alive and well in our stories. He is not not spoken of. Um, we make fun of him, even though he's not here. Um, we're irreverent about death. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, that's the only way we can do it is just because it's so big. You've got to put it into something that you can handle. I remember hearing Alan Watts say that uh, there's two paths you need to go down. One is exploring death all the way till the end like to wherever it takes your psyche and your soul. And the other one is uh, that it's all just a cosmic joke. You know, yeah. that, right? And I think there's that saying about the Buddha that once they figure it out, they just laugh hysterically because it's... It's ridiculous. Uh, you feel you're on a different planet now. I found that after Kylie and I broke up that the grief from... Even though I was very... Uh, conscious that this was a path I'd chosen and that I felt like it was a hundred million percent the right choice and I was in the right place. I felt like a lot of grief I'd never processed in my life was being invited to. So I'd never explored uh, grief sober. So, you yeah. know, I, I was finding these bottoms that I'd been avoiding. And then I found myself really thinking a lot about death because you were saying, you know, breakups and death are not so different. I found myself mm -hmm. really thinking a lot about death. And then um, during COVID too, you know, I think that was for anyone who hadn't really fully explored it or like gone down to the end of like, this is all temporary. It was so easy to have that amplify, which I think is actually a good thing because if we can see ourselves in the amplification, you know, it's almost like every moment I'm living is so much richer because I've sat with loss. And so I realize that every moment is a loss of sorts in that to love big, to like love life, to step up to life big, to open your heart big time, to share it with someone in my, this is what I'm coming to realize is that it is to grieve because to love somebody, you have to 
be able to go to the depths of grief in order to keep opening, which doesn't mean you just go do that blindly. Like you got to bring some boundaries with you. You can't just fuck. I love and love and love. It's like, that's not a great idea. Cause there's a show called the Tinder swindler. You can watch and that'll, <laughs> oh, that's true. That'll tell you your life. But it is this idea that every moment we're living and loving, we're actually grieving because it will end. And I remember just having that taste of like, shit, I don't want, to not feel this, to not have conversations like this. There will be a day that I am, a, you know, I'm actually stardust, not a body made of stardust. So I'm curious what that brings up for you um, and what your thoughts are on that. Uh, because I feel like it is a different world for me now. Like uh, moments matter more. Maybe now that I'm going to become a parent any day, there's also a like, what kind of world do I want to leave? I think, I mean, how it felt for me before great tragedy was my uh, my bandwidth was like, if, if we were on a hun- zero to 100, I lived between, you know, 25 and 60. Like, you know, like hard times were 25 and 60 was like the best I ever had. When Nate died, I, I now, I vacillate between zero and 100. And it's this, it's just a That's better beautiful. ride. Yeah. It's a better ride. It's It's dangerous. It's scary. But I just don't worry so much about what it feels like because I have felt so bad for so long and now I'm doing fine. So I've circled that roller coaster enough times to go, it ends in joy. It ends in joy. So if I have a really bad couple days and I just feel sorry for myself and I don't want to be a widow at 45 and I don't want my kids not to have a dad and I'm dating at 45 in LA, it's just enough to make you just want to jump, jump, die. You know, you're just like, well, lucky him because he's not stuck like on hinge in LA at, at my age, you know, but then I'm like, what an adventure, you know, I, I'd slept with one person yeah. before I met Nate. So like who gets to have a great marriage and have two amazing kids and then gets to go have this whole separate life. And so you just have to keep re yeah. just tell the story differently. Just whatever serves you is what you have to memorize. And so, yeah, the idea of it all going away, like when I look at my kids now, I'm like, you're not, I don't, I mean, I hope we all stay together for as long as possible, but once you've been through it, you know, there's a chance out there that it will be you or your family or your, I never thought in a million years that this would be my life. Um, And most of my life I had planned out pretty much exactly how I wanted. And for the first 40 years, it went exactly as I had planned. Um, And I find it not ironic that he died right at 40 when, I mean, at my, when I was 40, it felt like a real um, halfway mark. But yeah, I wouldn't trade. I love being alive so much more than I did when I was just kind of a robot the first, you know, 40 years, kind of just achieving and doing. Um, I hurt more. I'm more sad. I have a lot um, lot more um, pain than I ever had, but I, I wouldn't trade it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't switch any of it. Yeah. It's amazing that the 25, like the or lower than 25 and the above 60 always existed. But isn't it so fascinating to look at, let's say even our family tree or culturally, because they often sort of mesh together, Yeah. Uh, that often people didn't allow, like that range is kind of inherited, you know, same yeah, to me. For sure. Right. And then when I learned that grief was actually always there, I just wasn't feeling it. All of a sudden I felt... This, let's say, I would say I was probably, um, not, I was probably 30, maybe 35, maybe 40, but I didn't allow myself to experience sadness a lot. And so when I dipped into that, I went into adaptive strategies like I hoed it, hoed it up. You know, I did yeah. things like that, or I drank, or I, or I did both. And so, you know, I think about this a lot that if life circumstances wake us up to the complexity and the plethora of our human emotion and the just to how how incredibly complex we are but how beautiful that is we're not actually the simple like oh go to college get this degree get this job get married do this buy this house get a fucking car get the and all those things are beautiful like i don't mean that as a criticism but i think when i left my first engagement i was like holy shit how did I get here? Because I feel like I've been sleeping walking through my life. And I'd say that every time something, you know, challenging came, 
I woke up to greater capacity. And, you know, it's interesting because it's like, I wonder if that always existed. I wonder if as a baby, you are actually born into that unlimited capacity. And then life teaches you to not be too big, too much, too whatever. And then life's like, actually, we're going to give you relationship experiences, love experience, death experiences, challenges that are saying, actually, wake up to how powerful you really fucking are, which is I think when you wake up to how powerful you are, it's terrifying because you realize exactly. you've been living powerless, right? Yeah. And I think when you, you know, when you have your, your child, what you see is of course, in the beginning, they just freak out and then they're fine and they don't remember it. There's, <laughs> a, there's a real quick cycle through, this is the most devastating thing because you just took my lollipop away to I'm happy again. Like you watch them cycle. And I think um, my brother-in-law is actually sober 14 years. We always thought he was going to be the one that died. So we, he and I still joke because we are like, how the hell did you make it? And your brother didn't. But, you know, one of the things that you talk about in terms of, and I was never a big drinker, um, but what happened when I, when Nate died, I had to stop drinking completely. And I still, maybe I'll have a drink. I've never had a problem. But what I realized is alcohol is possibly the worst thing you could ever do when you're grieving because it, it screws up your brain and your ability to get to the dark spot and really sit with the pain so you can't tell if you're drunk, if you're happy, or if you're sad, or you can't, you have no, so, you know, that was a big part that kind of changed in my life because I realized the things that don't serve me at all, and alcohol is one of them. Um, it, you just, you lose that, you lose the range because mm. the alcohol numbs it on one side or the other or pushes you too far to fun. That's not real fun. So alcohol huh. is really interesting because it stretches that number, but in a fake way. So That's you think you're having fun, yeah. but you're not. Um, it's drunk you fake still, you. Yeah. And then if you don't do the work, it keeps coming. And I remember the first couple of weeks that everybody was like, take a Valium, take an Ativan. I'm like, listen, bitches, I'm not missing any of this because I don't want to <laughs> run. I don't want to run this road again. Like, don't yeah. numb me out because I, I know in my soul I have to go through this. So please just let me be a lunatic. Don't medicate me. Um, now I, do, I take that back. There are some in the beginning, the first week or so, you might just be off your rocker, which I think I was a little bit, but I remembered very soon that I couldn't, like I would wake up and not remember what, what I was, what had happened. And I was like, Oh no, I don't want to be reminded every day again. Like I want to know it when I wake up, I don't want to come to it. I want to be like, he died and it's time to go to war with this experience and I'm going to fight to survive. Um, and I can't do it if I'm foggy. So I think that's a lot of the work. And so, I mean, I, and that stuff along with meditation brings you into that moment dancing, yeah. music. There's so many good drugs. Sit in meditation for an hour. You'll feel like you're crazy. You'll feel like you're high. You'll, you'll feel it all. Like dance to like pink for an hour and don't stop. Like you will feel something. You will move stuff out. So there's a ton of work to be done and a ton of tools to use, but they are not what, what we are traditionally told in uh, the United States. Yeah. Amen to that. I agree with that. You know, it is so normalized in our cultures. I'm Canadian, same thing you know, that alcohol is just a normal part of these coping mechanisms. But really, it, you know, I, I interviewed Gabor Mate and he just wrote oh a book called Oh my God, I'm obsessed with him. I know, me too. I was like, can we hang out more? But God, he didn't. I didn't call me when it happened. I didn't want to get rejected. <laughs> uh, but he, I, I was try, grieving try the end of, of our conversation. But he, um, he says it so well, like we, what we call normal is actually dysfunctional. And so all the things that are showing up in our culture are actually the sign of a toxic culture. And, you know, how we navigate grief, you know, I remember they removed the bereavement clause from the DSM when yeah. I used to be in pharma. And when they removed the bereavement clause, that was a huge, I had a friend who had gone through a loss and he was like, how dare they rob people of the depth of that? And I was like, oof. I, you know, at that point I was beginning to really ask questions like that. Like, the power of emotion. And, you know, I have another friend whose wife left him. He came home and her bags were packed and she was gone. And, you know, it didn't come out of nowhere like they never do, but it felt like it came out of nowhere. And he went to the doctor and the doctor's like, you're depressed. So here, I'm going to give you this drug. And he's like, well, no fucking shit. I'm depressed, you know? And he's like, but I'm not going to numb this. Like I need this. And like you said, there are times, and this is not a judgment of people's experiences, but I think when we have a village, you know, like the most powerful thing for me when I went through the breakup was that there was one night where I was just on the edge of tears, like I was in them and kind of the, <gasps> that yeah. kind of choking. And, this choking. Yeah. 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 
And my friend, my buddy called, we, we talked and he's like, are you okay? And I'm like, no. He's like, all right. And I was staying south of, I was about two hours south of Vancouver, just staying in a forest on my own, which maybe that wasn't a great idea, but he uh, drove down. Yeah. yeah. Well, he drove and he just came and he just sat with me and that was it. Like there was nothing. I just needed to tether to, to earth. You know, I needed someone to remind me that even though I knew it was going to be okay, I needed someone to be like, I got you when you don't. Yeah. And village, man. That's it. I mean, that's the, people are like, how did you make it? I'm like, because I had people. And yeah. I think we have a culture of loneliness. And I think Instagram and all these things that make us feel, we all have talked about this ad nauseum, but you know, to have uh, three or four people in your living room while you sob and they just hold space. And I, that's, you know, the cheesiest spiritual word, but it's so true. And I'm, you know, just learning how to do it. They don't say anything. They just witness it and it, and it, it works itself through, but we don't train for that. We don't like, what if we taught kids in school how to have a friend be crying and just sit with them instead of trying to fix it or to say, like, I see that you're really sad. How can I help? I love that question. And I, when I work with people as a guide, I'm always like, how can I help? I don't, just because I've been through it doesn't mean it, I know what you're going through. So how can I help? I mean, that's just, it's a beautiful question that we don't offer enough. Um, we start to add, you know, we start to say, do you want this? Do you want this? Do you want a drink? Do you want me to lay down? Are you good? Are you okay? It's like, I'm not okay. And I don't need anything. I, I, and that's what my, my group of friends now, I, I sometimes just am in awe of them because they navigate the grief with me with just deep silence. They don't say anything anymore. It's too late. We've said everything. So when I cry, they just wait. It's just like this quiet moment. Yeah. And it just, it comes and then I'll be like, whew, I'm back. And it's done where it might've taken hours four years ago. Now it's maybe 90 seconds, same emotion, but just a shorter wave. What has been, you know, this experience, what has it for someone who ha- isn't going through great grief, but is maybe not, is feeling lost, is feeling that anxiety, is feeling, you know, just that they're floating and, yeah. and just making their way through life. What is it that you've learned through this experience that you hope people can learn and, and, and bring into their life without having to go through that experience? Like, what has this really brought alive in you and what you think about life and what's possible? Yeah. I mean, the, the three things I say that have saved me and they're, they start with an M. So just the three M's. Um, I meditate religiously because the only way you can get through great trauma or even just a breakup or anything, because I still feel sad when I have a breakup or anything like that, but you've got to get a little space from those thoughts so you can see they're not you. So meditation practice for me with anybody going through traumatic things, you just have to sit down and everyone's like, Kelsey, I suck at meditating. I'm like, we all suck at meditating. That's why we meditate. Yeah. There is no good meditator. <laughs> there's never, there's not an Olympic event. They don't judge it. They can't tell who's meditating well or not. It, you, it, I don't even know what pe- people are like. So what do I do? I'm like, I have no idea. Just sit down and that's it. Just don't talk for 30 minutes and just be fucking crazy. If you're crazy in your head, you're meditating. Like there is no gold medal for this. Um, you have to move. You have to move in nature. You have to be outside and you have to see clouds. You, I mean, I walk around my neighborhood, which is environmentally challenged for sure in LA. And <laughs> I hug these, I, I hug these poor trees that are probably going to die early because of the pollution. But I touch nature now. I get really close to nature. I walk every morning at six o'clock, which I don't want to get up normally, but I get up before my kids do. I walk down to the strand and I walk for an hour and I watch the sunrise and I remember there's something way bigger than me. So I meditate, mm. I move in nature. And what was my third one? Oh, music. I don't know if people really, but I love to move and I love to dance and I, music moves me. It makes me cry. If I, if I love having sex to music. I love dancing to music. I love being in a car with my girlfriends with music. So for me, music can take me where I need to go. So if I know I'm sad, I just go with it. I just play something really sad like Adele. And if I feel fired up, like, you know what, Kelsey, <laughs> you're going to have the best 40 years. I pay, play like Prince or something or I don't know. So Lizzo. I use Lizzo. Exactly. So yeah, meditation, movement, and music for me have saved my life. Um, journaling's always good. I wrote a book through journaling. Writing's work. And it can it can yeah. be as frustrating as it can be um cathartic. So you have to be aware that that can also put your panties in a bunch because you can get frustrated. Um, but you can talk, you can just you can talk it into your phone, get the words out. 
Um, I think that helps. But those are the things I would tell people. And I feel it's funny because I lost my husband. But if I like somebody or we're dating or I've, you know, I've been in love a couple of times, different type of love. And when it's ended, I felt, you know, um, lot, loss and letting go triggers grief no matter what. Yeah. And it's not my my husband's grief wasn't any different than my grief. It's still grief. Grief is grief. Um, and so I still get triggered by it. And I still have to remember, like, this is letting go. This is I'm guided and guarded by God. I'm guided and guarded by God. This is right where I'm supposed to be. It doesn't have to be forever like this. Just breathe. You're okay. Watch it pass. Um, go walk. Go meditate. Dance. And then you start to go like, oh, I, I can get myself out of it. What is on the the docket for you now? Like, what's what's next? <sighs> what's next? You know, I don't think that way quite as much anymore. Okay. Um, I only because what's I now? what's now what's now so- what's I, I I just don't I'm I'm constantly blown away at the things that come in when I just stay here. Um, I, I love the work I'm doing, guiding people through these, these parts of their life, these unique transformative tough times. Um, it feels like really nice to, to be able to help people. Cause I was helped by so many. I just, I, I, I don't know. I'm raising my kids. I've got two and a half years left of having kids at home. I don't want to miss anything. We finally, um, stabilized. So we laugh a lot. We have fun and I'm cherishing that because the last five years were dicey to say the least. Um, and the first nine and 12 years I was uptight and neurotic. And like, a, I was like a Karen. I was like an <laughs> annoying mom. I was like, put your helmet on. And, nee, 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 nee. and now I'm like, live and let live. Like, um, so You're I'm like enjoying, burning man mom now. I'm not quite there yet. I haven't done that yet. I know you're all screwed. Doesn't. I haven't I'm done too, it either. I've never I'm gone. too scared. I'm too many naked bodies. It makes me nervous. I just don't know if I can handle it. <laughs> I don't think you um, have to go into the, isn't there like an orgy tent there? Yeah. I, I want to go to like the uptight version. The like, the, <laughs> it's the, like the 45 year old mom. Karens. Yeah. yeah. Where I just dance and maybe yeah. I wear like a bra, you know, just nothing too crazy. <laughs> Not uh, little nipple tassels. Like you I see. I want a nipple tassel and I want to be able to get home when I want to get home. I know you're supposed to like be there, but I'm like, and I'd like the one with the helicopter that's like, and take me out. I'm done. I'm so, like that too. I'm like, I'll arrive late and leave early. That sounds A hundred percent. Give me 24 hours there and make sure I yeah. get out of there quick. Um, (laughs) yeah, I don't, I, I hope to fall in love. I hope to have a partner again. I hope to, um, I tell Nate all the time, like, don't fuck around, send me someone good. That's not as much work as you were. Plus the dying was a lot. So like, let's go a little easier the second time. Um, I look forward to seeing what my kids do. I look forward to having a career doing writing or, or this type of work, or I have no idea. I'm, I, I'm prepared to be amazed. Mm, Beautiful. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing and telling your Thanks story. For having me. And yeah, of course. And, and bringing the levity that you do to life. Cause you know, I, I don't think there's anything more powerful than laughing as we open, you know, and, um, for people listening, where can they find more of you? It can, it, I know that you have a podcast, um, which I had the honor of being on and, yeah. uh, you know, do you work with people, all that kind of yep. stuff? Yep. So you can go to, KelseyChittick.com. That's where kind of the guide work is. If you were looking for somebody just to kind of be a light along the way, that's sort of how I envision what the work I do. Um, when people just need someone to walk with them, I don't have a lot of answers, but I can, I can be right there next to you. How can I help? Um, I'm on Instagram. I'm not a huge poster, but Kelsey D. Chittick. Um, it's half personal, half work stuff. And then my book is called Second Half, Surviving Loss and Finding Magic in the Missing. And that's essentially mm. the story of losing my husband and, you know, the three or four years right after and how we got to where we are today. Beautiful. Well, we'll make sure we put all those links in the show notes. Kelsey, thanks so much. Thanks, Mark. <laughs>